Hello and welcome to the February edition of Putting Out Fires. I'm Dennis Rubin and I have two incredible guests with me here today that's going to share some information that will be important to you and of course to our job and maybe most importantly to our community. Corinda Trowbridge happens to be a master's of nursing degree person that also is a nurse and runs our quality control, quality assurance program. And she's probably going to correct me on the proper title. QA, QA manager for our EMS division. Absolutely incredible. And you do a great job. And also joining us, and we'll be discussing another very important issue, is Captain Chris White. And I believe you're at Fire Station 16? Uh, Station 3. Station 3. So thank you for joining us today. We've got a great show in tap for you. So if you will, get that bowl of popcorn. uh, Find the the most uh, uh, comfortable recliner. Get all settled in. And let's get right to it. Why is that program, our quality assurance program in EMS, important? So not only do we have a legal obligation to make sure that we are meeting all of our measures, Uh, We have an ethical obligation to our community and our patients, and we are also trying to make sure that we measure up to our protocols and that we are in accordance with all of our protocols. And we are looking for not just the punitive, not just the negative. We like to acknowledge the good that we do and maybe draw attention to some things that we could do better. I I, uh, know that most systems have a very robust uh, QA, QC program, QI program. I know when you go across the country, it's different letters, so please do forgive me as to, to what the name of our program is. But I, I think the things that you mentioned, being in line with the law, uh, providing a higher quality of service, doing the very best we can for our community, really ends up being pretty important, doesn't it? It does. We have to have the documentation to support it, though. So that's not the nobody's favorite part of the job, but it's a necessary evil. And I, I try to make that process as smooth and simple as possible. There's a lot of uh, pull down boxes and uh, a lot of things that allow a member that has to prepare a EPCR to do it rather quickly and efficiently. Is that a fair statement? Ideally, that's the goal. That's our intention. And we continue to look for ways to improve that process constantly so that we get a complete and thorough picture. And that picture is painted of the incident for all the reasons that you've shared. Yes. So we have to make sure we meet CMS standards, um, all of our local, state, and federal obligations as far as documentation. So those are constantly updating. And I would dare say, too, because I'm the person that has to worry about this, it also reflects the ability for us to make a revenue stream to try to uh, make the cost of the ambulance system somewhat pay for itself. I know it doesn't, but it gets close. Yes, so our documentation also has to support medical necessity for the patient. And if we don't do that, sometimes that obligation can land, that financial obligation lands on the patient. So we want to try to avoid that when we can. So medical necessity is probably a a prompt or a cue that you would like to see in just about every alarm that we respond to that is a medical necessity. Ideally, but that's not always the case, unfortunately. Well, I I know through training programs like this, with your great work, uh, I've got to give a tip of the hat to to Chief Heath. Uh, He's constantly providing great information on the morning Zoom meetings. Um, Hopefully, we'll get to that point. Uh, If we weren't able to do the cost recovery that we do, things like brand new ambulances, uh, having uh, the the, uh, top of the line uh, uh, equipment, pulse oximetry, uh, uh, the pulse ox uh, and, and things like that. Video laryngoscope is what I was trying to remember. Uh, I, I think they go off at about twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a copy, roughly. I would have to check them out. They do. Yeah. They do. That was a softball, but I'm yeah. the guy that has to sign the requisitions. Use, good thing we don't use it very often. But they're expensive. Uh, any of that equipment, though, without having that revenue stream, what I'm trying to convey is this: without having that revenue stream, uh, let me try this. Uh, Having the, the lift equipment uh, for the stretcher, as an example, the power uh, lift, we wouldn't be able to afford it. So making certain that we have that revenue stream that supports the things that our members need to do their job safely, efficiently, effectively, and also to help protect the community wouldn't be possible without it. We've got to check those boxes. We do. Uh, and uh, again, although that's the smallest part of making sure that we're in line with the law, making certain that we're doing the best for the patient. It certainly is one thing that we want to think about. Should always be in the back of our minds. You mentioned that um, sometimes that we have to get punitive. I think in the the, uh, terms of QAQI, 
punitive usually means retraining. Is that a fair statement? We try not to come at it from a punitive approach. We look at these as opportunities for improvement. Right. And, and so, not just on their end, but there might be things on our end, on the backside, that we can improve to make the processes easier. And, and I know the quality of work that our great men and women do in this department, uh, and unless it was something intentionally done to harm a patient, the trouble that they would be in would be essentially uh, retraining, re-guidance, uh, making certain that they understand what the mistake was, and then moving forward. So punitive uh, is something that I really try to save for the extreme yeah. cases. Uh, and I, I just couldn't imagine if anybody was doing their very best to deliver patient care that that word would ever be associated. However, um, I've been in systems where retraining or training is absolutely necessary, and we're not above that. And, and even for a person like me, I uh, do my best to maintain my EMT basic. And I'm saying that to a person that has a master's degree in nursing. But that's the whole idea is that we're all prepared, capable, and ready to deliver the best emergency medical care to our range of capabilities. And then nothing is done until the paperwork's done. Did I say that right? You did. If it's not documented, it wasn't done. I had a chance to sit in on my very first run review. And I hope I'm getting the right term. But boy, what an eye-opener when yourself and Dr. Allen went over the cases uh, that were like the eight or 10 most interesting cases of the month. I really uh, uh, value that. I don't plan on missing many, hopefully no more uh, at all. Uh, it was just that good. But would you speak about that and, and how that system works? So monthly we do a peer and case review. Uh, we try to pick the most, when I say, I try to pick the most interesting cases, um, some that we might not encounter regularly. So I pick those that might have some surprising outcomes or some, you know, heroic measures that we performed and, and did a fantastic job at. And some of those, unfortunately, might have some opportunities that we can improve upon the next time we encounter that patient. But uh, they're always very interesting. It's always great to have a good audience and get those different perspectives and, and takes on those calls. Uh, so we love to do that monthly. I always have a hard time just picking 10 or 15. It was, uh, it was incredible. And the good news is that I can recall um, a lot of the outcomes were positive. There were a few outcomes that didn't turn out so well. However, I, I think it's 179,000 people will die in the United States right. today. It, it's just simply a, a matter of living. Folks are going to pass away. Uh, but boy, the services that we, we delivered was, were incredible. Some of the cases where, uh, for instance, all the soft tissue was degloved off of uh, a person's uh, face and scalp, uh, and they were out of the hospital in two days or three days. Yeah, two days That later. was amazing. But I think that can only happen with the incredible care that we provide uh, on the street prior to even getting to the hospital. So, again, making certain that we're reaching that highest level bar. And I could also tell that Dr. Allen really enjoys being a part of that process. He is one of our superstars that goes about very quietly doing his job. I hope we can actually have him on one of the programs of putting out fires in the future. Oh, that would be great. He's always he's always a joy to be around. Maybe maybe we'll have you and him on as guests. What do you say? He would do all the talking. Uh, <laughs> he, he he enjoys talking. He has so much to give and so much to provide. Uh, and boy, his collection of experiences to oh, me yes. was overwhelming. And and he just continues to love doing medicine. It was just a joy being around him. I've had a chance to be in stuffy meetings and have discussions about where we're headed and what we could afford and couldn't. That was the first time I kind of saw him in the doctor role. What a rock star. Just bring him a Diet Coke and you'll keep him talking. Uh, we uh, we really had a great day that day. And then we did a second part uh, that also looked at QAQI. Uh -huh. um, and again, he had nothing but the kindest, most wonderful things to say about our department about the women and men that make up our apartment, about where we're at. And he has said in so many words, he was very, very proud to be a part of our emergency medical service delivery system. He's a fantastic resource, and we are fortunate to have him. We truly are. We truly are. Well, when I finished that training, the next day I had a chance to sit in on your lecture, Captain. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain White from Station 3. I said 16 earlier, so let me apologize. I still love you 16s, <laughs> but I get it. Three's just a little bit busier. And uh, boy, you guys also see a fair amount of medical calls and uh, your fair share of trauma. Am I saying that right? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you talked about something that's near and dear to my heart and that we probably have to begin focusing on as a department. Um, 
but that's another side of documentation. Not to meet laws, or I guess maybe it is, not to worry about uh, uh, receiving remuneration, getting payments, in other words, uh, and, and not about improving. But when we describe the fact that no EMS needed, what kind of problems can that cause? Well, I uh, kind of sat down and started doing some research uh, within the past uh, within the past few months and started to see that uh, there's a lot of paramedics uh, and organizations out there that are getting sued because they're not uh, they're not explaining the risks of refusal of care to patients and they're uh, they're not documenting correctly and I would uh, I didn't want to have any of our paramedics or EMTs uh, you know whatever our crews fall into that trap of getting sued a lot of these paramedics were losing their their license a lot of services were being charged uh, millions and millions of dollars for for just not having any type of documentation for run calls. So and I just don't want our department to fall into that, that mix. That's why I kind of came up with a class and worked with Corinda and Chief Heath uh, and Chief Karosik on it and kind of developing it and, uh, you know, uh, and presenting it to the fire department for the in-service. I would love to sit here and tell you I, I'm not familiar with anything that you speak but one of the cases happened in Washington, D.C. Yes, sir. And the fire chief was a very close person. I know, oh, wait a minute, it was me. <laughs> it was in 2009. And in essence, the paramedic that day had a planned vacation and her uh, me mechanism of treatment of a five-year-old girl, as I believe was her age, was to hand the child back to her mom, describe the fact that it was croup, uh, turn the uh, shower on, uh, make the room very hot, make it very moist, and she'll be fine. Well, of course, the next day, in a, in a desperate attempt to get her to the hospital, she passed away. Uh, I don't remember what the number was, uh, but I know it was astronomical. Do you remember what the, the value of that so, case was? Uh, I think the case said uh, they uh, were awarded just over $2 million. So that was a, a pretty low case when you get right down to it yes, by sir. today's standards. Also, you mentioned that Dr. Mount Varner was also personally sued. I believe ultimately, however, um, he was released from the case. The judge dismissed the case against him. Thank you, judge, for dismissing the case against me, as well as the mayor and other folks. Remember that when something like that occurs, uh, even though it may seem like they're refusing uh, medical care and you don't document you really open yourself up for things like that, don't you? Uh, for sure. And, and I think one thing we're kind of forget to add to this, Chief, is the fact that they can sue the fire department, but they can also come after us individually, civilly, mm -hmm. and come after our, you know, the things that we own, our home, and, and you know, uh, our, our, our livelihood as providers. Without so. a doubt, uh, the way they described that in the lawsuit that you mentioned about Dr. Mount Varner, was I was sued personally and professionally. The mayor was sued personally and professionally. Um, the uh, EMT and the paramedic that were there personally and professionally. Um, and then, of course, the only one that stuck was Dr. Mount Varner. And I believe that's because doctor was in front of his name, deep pockets, in other words. Mm -hmm. But as it would come to an end, the settlement did not include any financial loss of Dr. Mount Varner. I'm thankful for that. But one thing that I do want to point out, by the absolute gross disregard for that five-year-old's life. I think, she, was she five years old or two years old? Uh, two years old. Two old, years old. Right. Two years old. I want to be accurate in case anybody wants to look it up. And, you know, Google is always just a few taps away, yeah. so please don't hesitate. I want a serious note. Um, but I went to the chief of police, and I urged her that we should file some type of a claim, some type of a crime against this paramedic that abandoned the patient. The only thing that stood between me and getting that indictment for the paramedic that had to go on vacation, in her opinion, uh, was highly valued compared to this, this two years old life, was that the police chief had the autopsy by now, and it was natural causes. She said, if you can get the medical examiner, which I did try to get yeah. that done, changed to anything but that, even if it was a suspicious death, that the police department would be glad to file charges. It didn't happen. But what I'm sharing with everybody is we're always just that close to being in a position where we have to worry about covering our own backs. What if, in fact, she would have provided treatment and especially the documentation? Although in this case, I think the mother was urging the paramedic to take the child to the hospital. Yes. I really don't think we would ever be in that position. But I'm just trying to share with you 
and the great presentation that you provided, that it's something that we have to think about. And when you're you're listed as being sued personally and professionally, even though you're praying you're going to get dismissed from the case early, which thankfully I was, it's still pretty unnerving. It just adds a layer of stress that you don't need. So what can we do about that? How can we uh, prevent other, ourselves being in a situation where uh, no EMS needed doesn't come back to bite us? So I think uh, uh, there's two things. is documenting every interaction uh, and using the street sheet uh, that Corinda has came up with and, and – uh, with our conversation that Corinda and I have had, if uh, anybody has any questions about how to use that street sheet, she's always willing to help and always a phone call away. Um, and hopefully we're having some more training on how to utilize that street sheet and documenting every encounter that we have with patients. So if it's the, uh, uh, the individual that's walking away from us as we're pulling up to a call or, uh, you know, uh, like one today, I we we ran where the I walked in the room and the individual said, "Hey, I don't need you. Please go away." And so, just documenting that and also explaining the risks of refusal of care. Uh, that is uh, one of the biggest things that I found through some of my research is that uh, paramedics weren't explaining the risks of refusal of care to patients. So I think those two things uh, will really help protect our, the paramedics and EMTs and crews. For the future. Captain White, the $64,000 question is this. The patient that you saw today that said, don't touch me. I don't need an ambulance. Of course, if, if you would have touched him, it would have been assault. If you had taken him to the hospital, uh, it would have been kidnapping. So thank you for not doing those yeah. two things. How long did it take you to fill out the street sheet? Uh, about five minutes, if that. So five minutes of your time. What I'm hearing on the morning Zoom calls is that desire to learn more. You mentioned that Maybe some more training is in order, not only to how to prepare the form. You mentioned Corinda once again uh, could help with that. I know you'll help with that if needed. Definitely. When, when though, will we come up with a proactive way of incorporating that training into our EMS uh, repertoire? I think that's something good to work with as, uh, as our, our fire academies come around and working with our new hires and then uh, coming up with uh, and working with the training department and, and coming up with a way to get a training program out to to the membership on how to uh, work through a, a street sheet. And it is a simple, a very simple documentation to it's use. Designed to be simple. To be, yes, sir. But to also protect that paramedic and that crew, myself, this government, if you get the point, uh, all those entities are going to be named in any kind of a, a legal action. Yep. And I'll stand behind the members 100% if they did the right thing. Um, and again, to provide the documentation, it's got to be incorporated in to do the right thing, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It seems like, Corinda, that we do an EMS in service about once a month. And I'm saying that as a, a EMTB that's trying to maintain national registry. Do I have that tempo about right? We do our peer review, our case review, and we also do performance improvement monthly. So it's the last Friday of every month. Anybody's welcome to attend. But the class that you provided for the, me, the I the thought was an in-service. In service. I think Quarterly. the in-services are in the spring, and in, there's spring one or two fall. in the spring and one or two in the fall. So my question to both of you, our, our Next great in April. Uh, team, yep. can, we, can we get this incorporated into the spring? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yes. It's already scheduled for April 22nd yeah. and April 23rd. Do we, yes, uh, do we have the curriculum? For, for the April 22nd and 23rd. Uh, I was uh, going to present the same class I did uh, this past in service. Okay. Um, I think, honestly, it was brilliant. I hope that there's a mechanism to get it in front of everybody. I'm assuming that we do the same class two days in a row, and that's the program that folks can also call in on. Uh, I think so, yes. Zoom. I yep. would hope that sometimes they, they may not be paying 100% attention, and I get that. Your class is one of those where they really got to buckle up and, and look deeply into your eyes yeah. and, and get the message. Uh, it's such a simple message. It's such a clear message, but it's also so critical, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, just to protect, a, you know, and, and my thought process during this whole, uh, as I was kind of putting this together, was the fact of 
uh, you know, we've all worked hard to get where we're at, you know, through the, all the education that we've been through as EMTs and paramedics, you know, uh, and the fire schools, the different certifications that we all hold. And I'd hate for that to be taken away just by something so, something yeah. so simple as a five minute documentation form. Good, good. So, I'm looking forward to that. I hope that we can continue to move that ball further to get the uh, documentation as it relates to no EMS needed. That um, probably even shouldn't be said on the radio. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I I agree. So I agree. And that's something that Corinna and I and, and Chief Heath and, and Chief uh, Karosik had a lot of conversation about. And, it's going to be a culture uh, change. It's, be, it, it will be a culture change for us. It's going to take some time. So. And, and um, not that we're in a hurry, but this is one of those cases where the sooner we can get the message out, and I hate to use the word compliance. I'm, I'm not about making anything mandatory. The couple of things that we ask folks to be mandatory, either directly related to health and safety, where one of our members would get killed or, or severely injured, um, or we say, like the fitness program coming up, it is mandatory, but it's non-punitive. <laughs> yeah. So, again, the, the whole idea is that we're stretching. We're trying to get a little further ahead of the game. We're doing the right thing for our members. We're doing the right thing for our community. Uh, we're making certain that it's not by punishment. That's never going to be the way that we'll get to where we need to go. So I hope folks hear that loud and clear. I couldn't have been any happier sitting in on your class, your session. Um, as I say, if I can make it, I'm going to try to make all of them. Yours was also a treat. Uh, so enlightening. Had so much great information. Of course, I about fell out in my chair when you brought up Dr. Mount Varner and the <laughs> District of Columbia Fire Department. But, but again, um, that's one of those cases that is worthy of study, um, yep. simply not to repeat the same mistakes. Uh, we take a lot of time and trouble uh, learning from other fire events, uh, whether it was the explosion in Kansas City, Missouri that killed six members, uh, Hackensack, New Jersey that killed five members, uh, and I could go on down that list. We have got to do the same thing as it relates to emergency medical care and services to protect us, to protect our families, to protect our jobs, and their jobs meaning the government can't pay out too much money so that they can no longer pay us, you get the idea, um, as well as to do the very, very best care for our citizens. Did I miss any critical, important parts about QA or QI? Nope, just know that uh, I'm a resource for our folks and I'm always available. How do they get in touch with you? Great point. How do they get in touch with you? Well, if, if, if my email didn't go to their junk email, my... <laughs> My signature line at the bottom of the page has my phone numbers, email. I'm typically available. I answer my phone at 930 on Saturday night. Some of you know that. I'm always happy and willing to help you walk walk you through that. And I also recently just sent out an email that had a street sheet tip sheet uh, just to walk you through the steps of that to help try to simplify it for you. And what's your email? Ctrowbridge at kckfd.org. Perfect. Um, and I've got a commitment from you. That if Dr. Allen will come on, I'll have you both as guests on this show one time. I think I can tug him this way. All right. I hope, and I'm buying the Diet Cokes. <laughs> Captain, what else are we missing about documentation, the street sheet, um, being able to to put together solid information, uh, uh, what we've discussed? So uh, you said about using the nomenclature, no EMS needed. And I think that... Uh, the, the nomenclature, the disposition that we're gonna, going to kind of direct towards is maybe is the uh, no treatment, no transport disposition instead of saying uh, no EMS needed, but then also following that up with the correct documentation. I love it. Would it make sense to be no treatment, no transport, EMS refused? Uh, yes, that would, that, would F, be, that would also be good. So, uh, I, again, want to convey the clear and concise message to the legal system, to the medical system, to the ethical system, to the fire department, that in fact we did our very best and this person is just not allowing us uh, to take them, take them on the call. I would dare say to both of you, I've been with you now about eight to nine months. I shouldn't know that, but come June, I'll be here a year. Um, we do about 36,000 calls a year. So I don't know what three quarters of that number would be. I should have had it prepared, but about 25,000. And we've had four EMS complaints. One was unfounded. The other three were so trivial, it didn't matter much. My point is, and only is, our paramedics are doing amazing work. Yeah. Work. Our EMTs as well. They Let me not leave them out. 
Um, and it's not necessarily under the best conditions. Uh, the description was provided to me that we had to break a door down. This wasn't necessarily an EMS, although it's going to fit into one, in, in one of the uh, high-rise buildings. And the reason why we had to break the door down, the management thought, is that we simply wanted to do it because we could. Well, as it would turn out, the door lock was busted on the home, on the apartment. The person inside had a system where she could put this fairly large chest of drawers up against the door and prevent it from being opened. So, of course, they had a forced entry. They right. found the young lady in the bathroom. Seems like so many patients are in the bathroom. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. You've seen your fair <laughs> share there as well. Just yeah. as it is. I, I don't know why, but it always is. And that she um, had been there for quite a while. And you can leave the rest to your imagination. But they took incredible care of the person. I, I think she was very kind in responding and, and thanking the, the firefighters. And, of course, that really wasn't in the EMS block of, of, of concerns. But that one was unfounded. And we sent it off to the people who had made the complaint, which was not the patient, by the way. Uh, and again, we, we had the members back. So doing the right thing at the right place at the right time, following up with the documentation, who can go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. All right. With that said, that ends another edition of Putting Out Fires. Thank you for sharing this time with us. We're going to continue to produce these programs to bring the best and most updated information to you, our great members. If you have any ideas, concerns, interest, want to come on the show, have a program to talk about, get a hold of Chief Grip. He is very willing to assist. He is our producer in this program. So Chief Tom Grip would be your man. Thank you. And that's all we have for today. Be safe. Chief Rubin. Why do we run emergent to everything? And can we adopt the siren curfew after dark? Paramedic Jerome Knee Neighbor at Station 7 on the second shift. What an incredible question. Uh, you make it awfully easy. That's one thing that we've been looking at very, very, very carefully at Fire Administration. I think in the past few months, you may recall, we went from at least two companies and in some cases three companies responding to an automatic fire alarm to a single company. We're going to be taking a deep dive into how we handle surface automobile accidents. Probably the first unit paramedic, the first pumper or quint will go emergency and when it's on a surface street, the balance most likely soon will be going non-emergency. I agree with you. I'm always worried about the safety of our members. More than anything else, I focus on making sure that you and all of our 475, soon to be 501 members, go home to their family completely intact, mentally, physically, morally, and, and everything in between. By having responses uh, less, uh, uh, how can I say that exactly, taking risks with emergency response, by lowering that number, I think, I think we'll be a lot safer on the streets. So please hang in there. Uh, again, much like we did the reduction in automatic alarms, fire alarms in buildings that were unverified using science, uh, we've got our communications chief, Chief McLaughlin, looking at the data now. We're working closely with Deputy Chief Andrew Novak, and let's see what we can put in place. And as always, we'll work through Local 64 uh, to make sure that they're supportive of. And that reminds me, I, I need to mention congratulations to Chief Novak for taking on the responsibility of Deputy Chief of Operations. So uh, please, if you have a minute, congratulate him uh, like many people have, not just you, uh, but all of our members uh, to be able to say the great uh, job that he's doing and how much we appreciate his work. So with that, this is a wrap. Dennis Rubin reporting again for putting out fires at Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department. God bless you all, and please be safe. Chief, why can't EMTs detect BLS calls on the ambulance, either being transported to any local hospital or during the transfer? Captain Aaron Schwab from uh, pumper 12 on the first shift. What a great question. If I didn't know better, you've been looking over my shoulder. In the master plan that'll soon be released, we've asked for permission to start a non-emergency ambulance transportation service. 
It would go to work probably somewhere about 10 a.m., would wrap up the night at about 10 p.m. We would work with the hospitals and nursing homes for them to understand that the non-emergency transports need to happen during those hours. The few hours before and the hours after, the members assigned to our non-emergency ambulance would go to fire station assignments, uh, wherever they were needed, or for that matter, medic unit assignments, according to the staffing levels of the shift commander. The view is that both will be EMTs. Uh, perhaps it'll be one more senior EMT, not to prolong their time in the ambulance. I know some members are uh, always uh, looking forward to getting out, but probably uh, with a newer member. And the belief is that they'll get some great opportunities to learn their paramedic or, or emergency medical technician skills, I should say, under the watchful eye of a nurse, perhaps at a uh, nursing facility or at a definitive care facility at the hospital, and hopefully wouldn't get into too much trouble as it relates to patient care delivery. And if the person needed additional assistance, why, of course, they would be calling for one of our paramedic units. So I hope that makes sense. We're really excited about getting that program started. We've been talking about it for a while. All we're missing now is to have this the large recruit school, or perhaps it's going to be two recruit schools, to get through the training process. And I'm pretty sure we'll be able to put that into uh, process shortly. A lot of planning has gone into it. And again, I think you're going to be really pleased with the results. Take a lot of pressure off of our emergency ambulances. Hardly a day goes by that I don't read uh, status zero or status one. Uh, and it makes me more nervous than you know. So great question. We uh, absolutely appreciate what you do. Please stay safe out there, Piper. All right, that has it. That's a wrap as we say in the business. Truly appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to be a part of putting out fires. 